seeing some of the officers here. Um, thank you for coming here. We have a lot of representatives from the civil society uh, organizations. We are seeing a lot of organizations here. We are seeing FIDA. We are seeing uh, um, um, Amnesty International. Um, thank you for being here. Uh, we representatives of the Nigerian Bar Association, especially from the two states. Uh, we thank you for being here. We are seeing some of you here. Uh, we're expecting the chairman of the MBA uh, play two uh, to be present. Uh, we're also expecting representatives from um, the Nigeria Bar Association Kaduna. Um, thank you for being here. Yes, we would always recognize your presence as the occasion goes by better in order for us to um, meet up with the scheduled timing uh, to ensure that the training commences immediately. Um, the Benzene, if you're available, ready for you, sir. Um, thank you, Fiki, and uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, it, um, it gives me pleasure on behalf of the board, management, and staff of, of Clean Foundation to welcome you all to this uh, webinar. Um, which is aimed at addressing the role of new geospatial technologies and um, the role they play in international and domestic legal proceedings and the admissibility or non-admissibility thereof um, during um, criminal proceedings. The webinar will also explore the 2015 Administration of Criminal Justice Act, which was passed uh, in the Jonathan administration and the changes on legal institutions and its impact on, on cases in Nigeria. I'm happy to inform you that uh, the webinar is organized in collaboration with the American Academy for the Advance of Science, um, AAAS, and also the University of California in Los Angeles um, in the United States, the University of Toronto in Canada, the State University of New York in Albany, and USA and Kent, law school um in you might recall um that in nigeria today we have a lot of missing persons in fact recently a few days ago we were also informed that uh, some school children were kidnapped in kaduna so unfortunately kidnapping has become a regular occurrence in nigeria currently nigeria has the highest caseload of missing persons in africa uh, with more than 90 percent of missing persons in Nigeria traceable to Boko Haram and the activities of Fulani, um, of bandits, kidnappers, and, and terrorists generally of different shapes and, and sizes in Nigeria. The government has adopted different techniques and strategies such as physical on ground search and also multi-sectoral coordination. And we've also been involved in tracing of uh, mobile lines and digital footprints in collaboration with technology um, te telecommunication providers, and in, in some cases, security agencies have actually conducted uh, search and rescue. So this training actually aims to provide information to, to, to judges, to lawyers, uh, police investigators, and even those who work with government agencies on the legal framework on the use of new geospatial technologies in the investigation, prosecution, and adjudication of cases um, involving missing persons both from an international comparative and domestic uh, lens. Um, and of course, for those of us who are aware, we know that currently Nigeria um, um, is before the International Criminal Court. There is a case um, which the former prosecutor actually activated before he left. Um, even though not much has been done about it, uh, but the idea is that if Nigeria is on air and will Um, so I still will take um, necessary steps to ensure that those who commit crimes against humanity in Nigeria um, are held accounts for, for, for joining us. And we hope that this is going to be an opportunity for us to, you know, learn from especially Dr. Ayodele Akinroye from the University of Toronto and uh, 
Teres Harris from the American Academy for the Advancement of Sciences, who are our lecturers today, and also to extend our greetings to all who are participating in this, including Kamari Clark, Professor Kamari Clark, and Professor Busher, who um, are our partners um, in this process. Thank you very much for, for joining us and we wish each and every one of us um, fruitful deliberations. And also please ensure that you participate in the quizzes that uh, um, will be done in, in the course of this training. Thank you and, and welcome on board. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Benson for the welcome address. Um, he has set the tone for today's training. Uh, for participants just joining, please register your name and the organization you present to the chat box. Uh, we, will resent, we will recognize your presence while the training is going on. Well, um, coming up next in this program is um, the introduction of trainers and program presentation. Um, this will be done by Professor Kamari Clark of um, the University of California, Los Angeles, and also um, with the University of Toronto. So Professor Kamari Clark, if you are here, kindly introduce the trainers and um, the outline for today's um, presentation. Thank you. Um, Professor Kamari? Um, yeah, she's calling into the meeting because she had some challenges uh, hearing, you know, some audio challenges. So she's calling into the meeting. Okay. Please hold on in. Okay. Um, we're, holding, we're holding on for Professor Kamari Clark to introduce the trainers to us. Um, you could see them, they are projected uh, clearly. Um, but then Professor Kamari Clark will do the honors by introducing them specially to us. While we wait for her, I would want to just um, acknowledge the presence of certain persons here. Uh, we've seen um, Mr. Authority Benson from Center of Peace and Environmental Justice in Biosa State. Thank you for attending this training. Abdullah Ali from Global Initiative for Advocacy Development from Castina State, from Castina State, all the way from Castina. Thank you for attending this training. Rita Lasso Jufida, Nigeria. Uh, play two states. Thank you for uh, attending the training. Godwin Ogusaya from Amnesty International Nigeria. Thank you for attending the training. Akin Doyi Dokas from FIDA JOS, play two states. Thank you for attending the training. Uh, Mutiu Akinsaya from the ACGMC, Administration of Criminal Justice Monetary Committee. Thank you for attending the training. Thomas, Thomas Ateda from National Human Rights Commission. Thank you for attending the training. Sandra Joseph. Okay, from Mr. Juna Center for Women Empowerment. Thank you for attending the training. Um, Ofen Ibiang from National Human Rights Commission. Thank you for attending the training. Okay, we also have Unwosu Infenuwa Patricia from the National Human Rights Commission. Thank you for attending this training. Okay, uh, Uzjezu Somtu from Human Rights Monitor Kaduna. Uh, thank you for attending the training. Um, Manza. And Jubri, I'm not sure I could pronounce it well. Um, he's one of our good partners from Clean Foundation from the Nigerian Police Force FCT Command. Thank you for attending the training. Okay. Ache Gunolani from the Guardian Newspapers. Thank you for attending this training. Jeremiah Adama from Human Rights Monitor. Thank you for attending the training. Daniel Etonu from National Human Rights Commission Abuja. Thank you for attending the training. Obina Nwankoe from the National Human Rights Commission. Thank you for attending this training. Well, um, participants kindly indicate the organizers you represent so that we can also call you out why this training is coming forth. So is Professor Kamari ready to proceed? Uh, yes, I'm ready. Uh, thank you uh, for the, thank you for your patience. Uh, am I free to speak and welcome? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. I can still go ahead. Okay, good. Uh, thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Olugbo, and welcome everyone to this legal webinar on law and evidentiary rules related to geospatial technology and the crisis of the missing persons in Nigeria. I'm sorry that I'm not on camera. I just had a technical problem and had to log off and log on. Uh, but uh, I'm hoping everyone can hear me uh, at this moment. 
And so let me just begin by uh, welcoming you and uh, I'll start with a few remarks and then introduce our trainers for today. Uh, so I'll start now with the, the recognition that we're in a difficult period of insecurity. Insecurity being one of the central concerns in Nigeria today and the time could not be better for this webinar. Nigeria persons in Africa with more than 90% of missing persons traceable to the decade long Boko Haram conflict in the Northeast of Nigeria, a significant percentage attributable to kidnapping for ransoms, farmer herder clashes, and a range of other opportunistic abductions. In addressing this crisis, Nigeria has adopted different techniques and strategies such as physical on the ground searches and multi-sectoral coordination involving the deployment of mobile lines and digital footprints in collaboration with telecommunication providers being mobilized to deploy security agencies to locate missing persons. Given the crisis at hand, recently we heard that Kaduna State has launched an early warning, early response system, and there are future announcements coming about other related projects underway. These projects are taking advantage of using new geospatial technologies to further aid in alerting constituencies of attacks and fires, as well as locating missing persons through a range of strategies, including the search for mass graves. This tap day was in the context of exploring evidentiary issues and challenges in Nigeria and in regional and international institutions, including criminal institutions. Today, our presenters will start by considering the 2015 Administration of Criminal Justice Act and its impact, and that is in Nigeria, of course, and its impact on cases of missing persons. And we'll move to explore the role of different forms of evidence and technologies and the role that they can play in international and domestic legal proceedings, as well as their admissibility or lack thereof within these proceedings. So this training is therefore one of the first of a series of multiple conversations that will occur in understanding our, the legal dimensions of the phenomenon of missing persons in Nigeria. And our presenters for today are two of my favorite lawyers in this field, Teresa Harris and Dr. Akenroye Akendele. So I'll start by introducing Teresa Harris and then move on to Dr. Akinroye. So Teresa Harris is a project director in the Scientific Responsibility Human Rights and Law Program. She manages, and this is of course at AAAS, the American Academy for the Advancement of Science. She manages the, pro the program's projects on science and human rights, including on-call scientists, a volunteer re referral service that provides technical support for human rights organizations, the Science and Human Rights Coalition Network of Scientific Associations and Societies, activities that promote greater understanding of the human right to science, and a new project on artificial intelligence and human rights. Prior to joining AAAS, Ms. Harris represented survivors of the human rights violations before United States courts, the Inter-American Human Rights System, and the United Nations Human Rights Mechanisms. She has served on the board of directors of Amnesty International USA and a member of the governing body of the World Organization Against Torture. Ms. Harris holds degrees in law, anthropology, and land use planning, and is a fellow of the American Bar Association. So welcome, Teresa Harris. Our next, the second trainer of our two trainers today is Dr. Ak uh, Ayodele Akeroye. He's a postdoctoral and teaching fellow at the University of Toronto. He was also an immigration judge with the government of Canada, and he was called to the bar, to the Nigerian bar in 2008, the bars of Manitoba and Ontario in 2015. He is included in the list of counsels qualified to practice before the International Criminal Court. Dr. Akinroye holds degrees from Ob Ovafeme Awolowo University in Nigeria, uh, an 
B as well as an LLM from the University of Manitoba in Winnipeg, Canada, and a PhD in international criminal law from McGill University in Montreal, Canada. Now, before his positions, he was in private law practice in Canada where he handled complex criminal, quasi-criminal, and regulatory matters. And he appeared before different levels of courts in Canada, including the Court of Appeal for Ontario. In fall 2017, he was a visiting professional with the Prosecution Division of the Office of the Prosecutor at the International Criminal Court, where he provided subject matter in northern Nigeria. He co-teaches international criminal law courses at the Center for Criminology and Sociolegal Studies at the University of Toronto and has taught at both the University of Winnipeg and McGill University, also in Canada. And he's a frequent contributor to continuing legal education events and legal legal publications. So both of our, our trainers um, are wonderfully equipped to take on the, the pressing issues of the day. Uh, today, the focus, of course, having to do with missing persons and evidence. And so please join me in welcoming our trainers for today. They'll review the format and the rules of engagement for this three-hour training, as well as the, the sub subject matter content. So we welcome you both and I'll now turn it over to you. Uh, please join me, everyone, in, in welcoming uh, Ms. Harris and Dr. Akin Royer. So turning it over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that um, very generous welcome. And thank you all for welcoming us uh, to, to be here this morning. <clears throat> So I, I think first uh, we have a poll to get a better sense of what uh, what everyone here is uh, interested in learning more about this morning, this afternoon in Nigeria. Is the, the poll available? Ah, there it is. So uh, we just wanted to get a sense of how, what, what you're most interested in learning about, and that will help us as we go along to make sure that we're covering, um, covering areas that are most of interest. So please um, select. Uh, the option that you're most interested in. And we'll just give people a few minutes to have a chance to Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have a very strong interest in learning more about geospatial technologies to find missing persons. And also scientific evidence this is this is very good okay this is very helpful thank you okay i think i think we have the sense of it at this point thank you So we will we will um, co we will cover all of this, but uh, this helps us if we end up having to manage time and prioritize this. 
helps us to know exactly what uh, is of most interest. So thank you very much. Um, the at this point we um, had oh, no more polls. <laughs> Okay, we uh, are, we want to introduce the topic, um, it, but Professor Clark and Dr. Logbo have um, done an excellent job already of explaining the, the, the urgency of this issue of missing persons, uh, perhaps a, a little bit more about the distinctions because the, the different uh, categories or, or types of missing persons, the situations uh, matter in the legal context. And, uh, and we'll be talking more about that in much more detail as we move through. But uh, just to be clear, there is there are a range of concerns related to this from a legal perspective uh, to this crisis. So uh, of course the individual kidnappings, abductions uh, on an individual personal level are uh, one kind of situation and, and, and presents a certain kind of challenge. But then as the concerns broaden and, and become more systematic, depending on who the perpetrators of those kidnappings are, um, and perhaps even in unfortunate circumstances, wrongful death, uh, it, the, the problem expands. When it becomes systematic and it is perpetuated by either um, in the context of a conflict, by, by uh, armed groups, by uh, government actors, then we move into uh, human rights concerns and uh, international criminal law, even war crimes. If it's uh, if those abductions are committed in the context of a conflict, and so um, those are some of the distinctions we will be talking about and pulling out in the context of the the legal discussions. The uh, main concern here that we'll be talking about today is how uh, the geospatial technology as a tool for identifying uh, and, and identifying those issues as a, a kind of evidence that is used in making these cases in, in, le in a legal context. Um, how that can and can't be used as evidence, what the evidentiary rules and laws are that um, allow it to be to be used as a tool. What would you like to add before we move on to, to module two? Okay, two? so I, I will just, um, Share a screen. Um, um, thank you, Ms. Aris, for the for putting the context of our training for the participant. So I will just share um, my screen. I think so people can see what I have here. Um, so please, can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay. Thanks. Um, just like I said by Dr. Lugo and Professor Kamari. Um, we keep mentioning 90%, 90%, but I feel that we should contextualize this further. And that's why I did it in this number. We have 23,000 people that are missing. Don't forget what we have here. Between 2008 and 2019, that has not accounted for 2019 to 2021 that we have here. 23,000 people are missing and continues to be declared missing. Again, we can say Boko Haram conflict, uh, we, but we all know that now it's beyond Boko Haram now, kidnapping up and down in different parts of the country and due to uh, in, in, um, in, in insecurity that is making everybody to be on their edge. And these are people that have family members, that have um, loved ones who are mourning them, who are unable to look at them, who are
able to use your special technology um, to look for that missing one. So having that information or having that background is very important for what we are going to teach today, uh, which is about what you get from Facebook, social media, uh, cell phone location, and how can you transport that into the legal framework in Nigeria using what we know from the existing criminal um, um, ACJ art, evidence art, and what has been done in the international world. And that's where myself and uh, uh, um, uh, Ms. Iris will come into play. Uh, before we go to the other modem, I would just want to talk about the aspect of the taxonomy of the missing person in Nigeria. And I want us to focus more on this screen. And if you look at it, these are the categories where missing persons falls within in the Nigerian setting as of today. Number one, we have issue of adoption, kidnapping for ransom, or other forms of gain that has become very rampant in the last one or two years, where bandits have kidnapped. You remember the incident in Kaduna, where uh, I think two incidents happened in Kaduna. The first one at that private university, and the second one that is still ongoing at the moment, where people, students were kidnapped. Not only students now, we also find tourists, um, tourists in Port Harcourt and in different parts of the countries are being kidnapped and even contractors, private contractors doing road, uh, road work or whatever. We also have this other one, which is the enforced disappearance, which is very rampant. And every one of us that are participating in this, participating in this, uh, uh, in this, uh, in this training, we know at least someone uh, that's gone missing, um, poor um, accountability in police custody when they arrest people, they do not document it. That again, it's against the, it is not in compliance with the SCJ, um, it's not in compliance with different, the, the police act, the new police act, and so on and so forth. We also know about people that, uh, the, the 90 people that died through the NSAS um, crisis in Lekki to get. He also, those are enforced disappearance. They were killed, their body were, were, were removed from Lekki Togit, and they were told, oh, nobody died. And then a corona in Lagos State, a professor came that said, there are 90 people that died from the uh, NSAS movement. That's also something that uh, also happens there. Also, we have those that were adopted with no political or monetary clear explanation. Um, people that just got missing, that we couldn't find, we cannot locate what is the reason why they gone missing? Maybe they ran from home or they just, you know, you just disappear into thin here. And then we also have these other categories of a missing person in Nigeria, uh, which is those that are, they were adopted um, due to widespread um, violence, uh, mother or theft. And there we can look at Boko Haram in Northern Nigeria. Um, and again, oh, 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 and this is where, importantly, this is where the issue of your special technology comes into place. Because if you apply the technology very well, you can use it to track how the movement of cities, how the destruction of cities or villages in the northern Nigeria or in different parts of Nigeria occurs per time. So you can see where there's movement. And again, if you use new technologies, you can actually locate where people were buried en masse, which has been done in Canada, and which I know is in the news that most people are aware of. And then we also have these forced disappearances and murder, which are dealing with in Nigeria, um, the bandit, the headsmen, uh, farmers in different parts of the world. Again, I also mentioned the fact that geospatial technology also has a capacity uh, for us to locate mass graves uh, where um, you know it's been documented by Anderson International during the fight against Boko Haram, several people were killed in custody, extrajudicial killing, and they, they were um, they were they were uh, they were they were buried secretly buried. Just special technology can help us to locate where uh, they are buried. I'm putting this out so that we can understand where the discussion about just um, uh, missing persons in Nigeria are framed conceptually and how we can apply the technology, the digital evidence that's going to be generated by satellite imagery, uh, uh, drone, uh, remote sensing, and how we can transport. Uh, the next module is going to be taken by uh, my colleague, Ms. Iris, is going to talk to us about uh, what is evidence, what is scientific evidence, and provide the more context in um, contextual background for that or legal uh, framework and contextual scientific framework for that. Thanks. Sarah, you are Teresa, we are on mute, please.
Okay, thank you. Uh, the it, it's important to keep in mind that litigation and and legal accountability are not the only purposes of evidence. Uh, when we talk about evidence, we're we're talking about any kind of documentation that uh, when put together helps identify uh, people find the locations of these missing people um, it can be used for pol as evidence as as um, a an explanation for policy advocacy there are many many different ways uh, we are just focused today on uh, legal accountability so um just a few examples of scientific evidence that have been used for identifying people for finding missing persons in different contexts uh, in in human rights litigation. So uh, these include forensic anthropology, for example, where um, identification of individuals in mass graves has been uh, used identifying the cause of death. Uh, statistics have been used, mathematical analysis to explain patterns. Uh, they've all this kind of scientific evidence has also been admitted um, to make particular cases, uh, make particular points in court, prove specific elements of crimes. And satellite imagery has also been used going all the way back to the International Court, uh, the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. Um, this is one of the first times that satellite imagery was used in international courts. And uh, this is, again, you can see how it's been used to uh, identify mass graves, show where military activities, movements of people. These are the kinds of things that uh, kinds of, of elements that satellite imagery and geospatial technologies can, can help to document. The International Criminal Court is really where geospatial technologies have been used in a, a much more expansive way for as evidence in court. Uh, they, this is imagery that has been collected by satellites. It's digital data that needs to be processed and analyzed by software. It's not just a photograph. It's, it's much more than that. And the analysis, the output of that, uh, which is done by a, a expert, a tech, technician, analyst, scientist, depending on the person, uh, they that is the evidence that's being presented in court. It's important to remember that, and that's why we're going to talk a lot about scientific experts and expert witnesses uh, in this case. So what are some of the things that geospatial technologies can prove? Uh, the locations and dates of specific conflicts, because you know the specific GPS location and the date that an image is collected. Uh, they've been used to document movements of child soldiers, uh, document arson when buildings have been burned, uh, destruction of cultural heritage sites, and um, it, and some other uh, issues that we will will discuss. But those are the main ways that that it's been used in the past. Um, in, in courts. Some of the potential uses for this uh, and, and why it's an, it, it's an excellent tool for uh, identifying and finding missing persons, documenting what has happened to them, uh, because this is information that's being collected by a satellite. It can access remote, dangerous um, areas that are difficult for investigators to get to. Uh, it enables rapid analysis of very large areas. It is objective in a way. It's it's not. Um, it, it's very different in that way from uh, eyewitness testimony, for example, which might be specific to the person's experience. You can look at historical events. You can go back in time uh, with satellite imagery because they're collected and saved. And um, sometimes you can see things that are very difficult to see on the ground. Uh, you can see changes in the landscape. You can see um, uh, things that in that in this case, this, these are changes in um, 
in ground cover in in the vegetation that would be difficult to really identify uh, on the ground because of the types of changes that they are. Geospatial technologies can also are very important for corroborating other types of evidence, um, other geolocated data, information from social media yeah, taken by photo, uh, cell phones, taken by um, it's things that are sent by email, all of the metadata that's in all of that digital information. Everything happens somewhere. So satellite imagery is a, is a way to locate that, to place it in uh, the geography and explain how things change over time and space. Uh, it also allows statistical analysis of large uh, information, large movements of people, and it can be used to um, corroborate, tie together ethnographic or sociological analyses too. There are limitations, of course, and it's important to remember these. Uh, satellite Im imagery is not collected all the time around the whole planet um, at every moment. There are limitations in the coverage and resolution that uh, the, the, the detail that you can get uh, from those images. Um, cloud cover can uh, makes it very difficult to view some of West Africa many times of the, the year. So uh, that's something to keep into consideration. Um, sometimes there are restrictions on what types of uh, locations that the satellite images can can capture. Uh, if there are national security concerns or, or other reasons why a particular location uh, can't be surveilled. There are also ethical considerations, um, which we can talk about more uh, as we go through the agenda. And there's cost. Uh, the, the, this is highly technical. Um, it's commercially available in many cases. The, the pricing, the software all have costs and, and require special expertise to, uh, to process. So again, this isn't a solution to everything, but it is a very powerful tool. So, um, but as I said, it is a type of scientific evidence and I've maybe explained going through some of the ways that that's the case. And there are always challenges in courts uh, and, and in the use, the legal use of scientific evidence. We need to have a way to prove that the scientific method being used, the tools, the knowledge is authentic and reliable. And uh, we'll be talking about that in much more detail, how the different laws address that. Um, is the person applying the scientific method well qualified to do that? Have they applied the method uh, correctly? Do all of the parties in the uh, the litigation have equal access to examine and uh, test the scientific evidence to question it and how much weight should the scientific evidence be given by the court uh, we are all attorneys not scientists and uh, the information can get very technical very quickly and so it requires uh, skill and thought to make sure that the court Court really understands what the and now we will move to um, the rules governing scientific evidence in Nigerian courts. Dr. Akinroy. Um, thank you, Ms. Aris, for that. Um, and your presentation is more, um, it's useful for us to understand um, the domestic aspect of it. Um, I'm going to share my screen now. And uh, one, one, second, one second, just give me one second, please. Okay. Please give me one second. So you can use my screen. Okay. 
Um, I'm not sure I'm seeing the right screen. Yes, we um, can. Yes, we can see it. Okay. Okay, thank you, everyone. Um, I need this. So before I talk about to just say that this particular session is going to be interactive and I want it to be interactive um, so that we can share knowledge together um, from those that have been on the field um, litigating using digital evidence um, in litigation. And one of the things I do know, um, I, when I did a scoping of the landscape you know, in Nigeria, I do know that people that have into election petitions have um, used digital evidence or have pleaded or have argued issues related to digital evidence. And people that also work in economic and financial crimes have used uh, um, um, and pleaded issues related to the digital evidence. And if you are in the in our midst today, I will appreciate you also uh, to engage with us. But before we start, before I go into the meat of the presentation, um, I would like to do a survey to see the categories that we find ourselves professionally in terms of our work. Um, please, if you can quickly just um, pick where you fit within these categories, uh, I really appreciate it. And it's important because so that if, if I need to, I don't need to go, I'm gonna to try to make this presentation to be as simple as possible or not too complex so that everyone can understand it. Um, so if you are judges, if you are lawyers, if you are law enforcement, if you are civil society, uh, family, I would really appreciate so that I can know how we can proceed um, in terms of the knowledge base. But again, like I said, it's going to be very interactive and I want everybody to get involved at one point or the other. Why the polling is going, um, I'll move on with this. Um, in terms of the overview, uh, this is what I'm gonna present. Uh, when we talk about scientific evidence, or if you put it back into a layman's term, if you talk about digital evidence, whatever comes from satellite imagery, remote sensing, drone, they are still digital, we can call them digital evidence. And most likely you're going to hear me talk about digital evidence, digital evidence, digital evidence a lot. Uh, we can talk, we can approach it from different angles, different areas, but I feel that these are the areas that we need to focus on in this half day seminar. If there's a need for more training in other areas, I'll be more than happy to offer those training. We are going to look at the issue of disclosure obligations on part of both the prosecutor and also the defense counsel. And when I talk about cancer, I'm talking about lawyers representing the accused, representing the families of missing one or whatever. What are the disclosure obligations that is on to, that you are required um, to, to meet? And then I'll look at the issue of admissibility in a very limited way. Um, and then um, look at issue of probative value. And then importantly, I also look at the issue of courtroom presentation. Uh, what is the essence of having using just special technology um, to, to investigate missing persons in Nigeria and when you cannot transport it in a way that will make sense to the judge, even if it's admitted into evidence, if they don't apply the necessary weight to it, then you have made it, you have made a mess of your case. So every legal step has to be followed, the presentation has to be tough note, and that is what I said. Um, I will make a, a, a part of my presentation will be on courtroom uh, presentation of the digital evidence, scientific evidence um, in, before the judges or the trial of fact, and then I will conclude um, with some brief words. So, uh, so the rapid de the development of uh, technology and the use of digital devices such as mobile phones, um, computers, and tablet. Um, have become an indispensable part of our modern society. And again, have resulted in a significant transition from the creation of physical to data file. If we need to look at this, all we need to look at um, is look at Facebook in Nigeria. I know Facebook is very popular in Nigeria. There's a lot of data and data and data that's being created per the second on Facebook in different groups and different um, platform and beyond Facebook, they also that. So every day we move around in, in, in our day to day, you CCTV, that is data. Um, your car communicating, that's data. You wear Fitbit or Apple Watch, that's digital data that's been you know, created every day. That is just the background. And if you look at the disclosure obligation that we have when we go to the criminal part, it's part of the Nigerian constitution, the right to disclosure 
is a principle of fundamental justice and it is necessary to fulfill the right to full answer and defense that is protected by the Nigerian constitution. So if you look at it, and this is, you know, couched uh, under the right to fear hearing principle. If you are looking elsewhere, you might not get it, but if you look at section 36.1 of the Nigerian constitution, um, it talks about the right to fear hearing, principle of fear hearing. I need to know the case um, that you need to be met. So if I zoom in, we are using digital evidence or scientific evidence, just special evidence to say that someone committed a crime in Boko Haram. Um, uh, this uh, non-state actors did uh, not crime book about in the northern um, part of Nigeria. This non-state actor committed this crime, and we've charged that person. That person has the right to fear hearing, and that is presumption of innocent, public trial for criminal offence, uh, except in certain circumstances, public safety order when you know you, you might have to have a private uh, trial instead of public trial. Written charge informing the individual of the details and the nature of the offense. This you can find also in the ACJ, ACJA, and also in the Constitution right to a um, legal practitioner of your choice, um, right to examine witnesses and call witnesses um, to the courtroom in Nigeria. Most likely, you will need to call witnesses. And that is part of a constitutional guarantee that everyone has, um, that, that is part and parcel of your right as an Nigerian. And we can go into the issue of interpreter, and then we can go to the issue of access to the records of the trial proceeding to. That is also part of it, that even when you go to court of appeal, or you appeal a case of a trial um, court, you have the right to assess that record. Also include everything that is standard to that court, maybe in terms of evidence. And not only that, the Prosecutor, I'm now looking at it in the, in the context of a criminal trial, the prosecutor has an obligation to show and accuse the complete case to meet through disclosure of four equipatory and exculpatory evidence in the possession of the prosecution that is not clearly irrelevant or privileged. So what does that mean? So when you have data from satellite imagery, that shows movement from one portion, one portion for in terms of when you go back in time, the prosecutor cannot say, I'm focusing on 2013 alone. If particularly 2014 might be relevant and might be exculpatory. So that has to be, you know, to be disclosed to the person, the defendant. That means it's a simple thing. This means that everything that to be relied on by the prosecutor is disclosed, and anything that may be relevant to the defense must be disclosed to. So if the defense or in a human rights litigation, the lawyers are bringing up evidence to show uh, that an occurrence did not occur, or that the person, um, uh, or there's a counter narrative to what the prosecutor is saying, or the federal, you know, Mr. DOJ, Mr. of Justice lawyer are saying, they need to disclose that information. So disclosure is a two-way street, not just from the state, from the state, from the state. It's also from anyone that wants to introduce evidence that might support your own case, including digital evidence, your special evidence. You have to provide um, that. Um, you have to provide that to both parties. Um, disclosure obligation may also spread to cover the form of the material disclosed as well as the necessary context. If you look at Nigerian constitution, there's no constitutional requirement for the form that disclosure might take. Um, so it depends on whatever form that the federal crown or the uh, not federal crown, the federal lawyer or the state lawyer wants to go. But again, we know that disclosure in Nigeria is typically manual. It's all paper, paper, paper based. Um, uh, paper based, but in other sector, in other countries, um, you cannot disclose a digital evidence in a way that um, the other party cannot access it easily. That would be a problem. Okay, it has to be accessible. It has to be reasonable accessible. I'm saying this because I know that there's a move now, whether we like it or not. Um, I know there could be some reluctant. Uh, there's a move from manual digital, uh, manual to digital. And it's a move that is going to catch up in Nigeria as much as more digital, uh, more technology has been used and has been brought into the country. And that is the reality that we have to deal with, which I believe, again, when I get to the analysis later on, that our evidence has not caught up with. 
Um, let me just take a pause and just make mention of something. If you look at um, the ACJ, um, the ACJA Act, you find out, if you look at the ACJ Act, you find out that, uh, that, that there was no mention of any digital, anything digital in ACJ. I did a search, I read it and I did the search. Where's digital here? Nothing. But the only provision for evidence that has to do is by evidence, receiving evidence by a real video link. And we have moved past that level in other parts of the world. But that, again, is something that we have to um, co consider uh, uh, again. So again, take for instance, um, if assuming the, uh, the, the, the federal uh, lawyer, the state uh, minister of justice, state lawyer, um, has some evidence, um, most likely, uh, the, the, let's say scientific evidence, and they were given um, some um, the access to satellite images that shows that this person was at, the defender was at a particular location within a frame of, a, a, a time frame, and they refuse to disclose that ahead of time so that the defense can prepare properly that is a breach of disclosure obligations as guaranteed in the constitution in section 361 of the Nigerian constitution. But here's the point. The breach of disclosure obligation does not necessarily result, um, the, the breach of disclosure obligation does not necessarily result uh, in complete um, breach of section 361. What do I mean by that? Uh, it must be shown that that disclosure flaw has the effect of infringing on the right to a fair trial by the accused. So if they do not disclose what they need to disclose, then you say, my Lord, we can't meet this case. We don't know the case we are I'm meeting and it, this person cannot get um, a fair trial. And what are the remedies? We are looking at remedies, which includes um, um, adjournment. Um, you can ask the court um, for an adjournment so that the, the prosecutor can provide those the, the important disclosure um, you can ask the court for a conditional disclosure order that unless they mandate the state to produce that, um, you can ask for a state of proceeding. Um, and that is, I think, is open to lawyers um, to do. And then you can also, uh, depend, um, depending on the disclosure error and the demonstrated impact on the right to fair trial. Those are some of the remedies that you can um, do. As I moved closer and into the issues, um, I want us to focus on this um, on this quotation. Um, it says, "Electronic disclosure has come has now become a fact of life." So I suppose that those of us who had not had had better adapt. That's the judge in a Commonwealth country that said so, that there's now electronic case management, electronic e-file and so on and so forth. And those are part of electronic disclosure um, or, um, framework that needs to be done. And here's the thing, here we, we look at it, um, the, 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 the virtual footprints that we live in the digital world are very vast. Um, um, a take for instance, the thorough investigation of serious crimes such as uh, that of missing person in Nigeria, if you use satellite imagery, um, can produce terabytes of information that needs to be managed and funneled into an organized system for the use of both the prosecutor, the accused, and the court and our judges. So here's the thing where, like I said, we talk about every incorporatory and exculpatory piece of evidence must be disclosed. But it cannot be everything that turns and turns and turns and turns of uh, data that can be used. So let me uh, in, a, in 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 Dubai that Nigerian flamboyant uh, person. I wish uh, I wish is a physical training. That Nigerian flamboyant uh, four one guy in Dubai. And when they raided his apartment, they saw a lot, a trench of document, a trench of computers. Lot and lot and lot. So if you have to go through that with the forensic analysis, it will take a lot to disclose that some of them are not relevant, some of them are relevant, 
And also for for, and for each of advanced free fraud in Nigeria too, they disclose lots and lots, and they, you know, they has a lot of uh, data that's been generated for that particular crime. But also, if you look at our day-to-day -day life, day-to-day -day life, every day, once you wake up, you pick up your phone, you generate data that could be used against you. You send an email, you go to the ATM bank to withdraw money, um, you do any transaction, you you know you are generating data, and that could pose a very um, problematic disclosure obligation on the uh, or even to not even to even disclose to even funnel through it to discover it to go through all those data might be an enormous uh, issue. In Western now the standard, so when cases are come are packaged and sent to the court. They don't do it manually like the way we do it in Nigeria. It's now digital. Uh, and lawyers and judges are now expected to have basic competency in working with digital files. Uh, when I was in criminal practice in Canada, I never received paper disclosure from the state. I just received tons of CDs that have been sent to me for uh, 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 for uh, as disclosures, and that means I have to be added to my computer in order to navigate that. And for instance, it, it, it courts in Western world are saying that the lack of skill or basic to, to make some digital disclosure will not render disclosure insufficient. So when Nigeria moves to a point where we have to, um, because I don't know how to use my computer, I don't know how to assess Word, PowerPoint, that that disclosure obligation has not been met and there's a breach of section that 6-1. Most likely judges will say, I think you have enough notice. You need to in, in, in improve your skills in that side. So here's what I've got that things. What are the typical disclosure uh, in routine in criminal cases? Um, if you look at um, the content of disclosure in a criminal, a typical criminal case, you know, we have the charging document, um, we have the police notes, we have statement, criminal record, witness list, um, witness list, photograph. Um, what else again am I missing for criminal? Whereas in that group, please, if you can put in the chat what I'm missing in terms of what are basic disclosure um, that needs to be provided by the prosecutor, whether a police prosecutor or the minister of DPP's office. Um, before once a charge is filed, I'm looking at the chat now. Please, if you can type it there, I will be more than happy um, to um, to integrate them to talk about them too. And in Nigeria, these are generally, you know, stapled either for copy or and written police note and written now at the point when disclosures, evidence, documents, uh, I mean, ad copy uh, will soon be phased out in the general court. People might say, well, yeah, you don't know what you're saying, but I think we are getting to that point as we embrace more digital, uh, as we embrace the digital um, uh, era. Bringing to where I practice or where I used to practice police note, um, summaries, everything that are created by the police or uh, with pen and paper are usually scanned and saved in digital and electronic form. And it has a lot of advantage, which uh, a lot of advantages, uh, which I will talk about the ease of access to it. I don't have to be carrying tons and tons of book uh, um, along with me. I can preserve it. it. It lasts longer. It it can be preserved longer. And the risk of mutilation that we find in those manual papers are, are, are uh, uh, reduce. Take for instance, if you look at cases that started from the High Court or from the Magistrate Court and gets to the Court of Appeal or to the Supreme Court, if you look at the case file, uh, you'll be embarrassed that, wow, this because different hands have touched it. And that is not something that happens in, when we move to digital um, um, disclosure of basic case materials and that. And like I said, adopting digital disclosure of evidence will improve efficiency and make it easier for parties to track entries by the police transfer to the DPP's office or deliver it to accused person or defend. Um, and also digital disclosure uh, tracking system allows for accountability and maintain a constant running bank of disclosures that can be easily assessed and reproduced. 
avoiding problems of tracking if there's a change of counsel, um, there's lost document and confusion over who asked for and who received. Uh, 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 about it is the fact that when technologies and that is going to generate is going to make more sense make more sense if it's digitally disclosed um if it's manually disclosed it's not going to make more sense it's not going to you might find some confusion in it so that is why we need again to move to that digital disclosure which we in, continue to improve functioning uh, expediency and transparency And here I'm making a point here that notwithstanding the over reliance on manual evidence, um, routine criminal cases increasingly um, in Nigeria rely on some form of digital evidence. All we need to look at is um, sexual uh, assault cases. We have one that is currently an high profile one that is Babao, Babai Jebu's case, uh, where there's a reliance on audio and video, virtual recording, or when we look at further money laundry cases. Or when we look at cases um, prosecuted by ICPC or EFCC, uh, where they disclose uh, they have access to banking record and electronic financial record, that usually in digital form. Though when they take it to the court, they they make it they turn it into manual process. When it comes to them, like in a digital um, form, we also have as you know the issue of um, CCTV or the popular one. Take for instance this recent one that is high profile in Nigeria, the young lady that killed or that that's claimed that allegedly killed. Um, the owner of a super TV, um, he did a video confession statement too. That is also part of digital evidence that is um, currently um, um, uh, being used in, in the Nigerian regime. Um, so again, I will just ask a question in the question in the, I will ask a question in the uh, chat box, please. Um, if you can answer this, that would be great as I move along with this presentation. Why answer that question? I would want us to look at this slide. Um, please, if you want to speak, uh, we'll be more than happy to grant you speaking privileges. But please keep your responses um, very sharp and very, you know, very, very timeless. Maybe in two, one minute. Um, please, um, can you mention the challenges that you have encountered in your practice on disclosure of digital evidence? All the challenges that you you think you anticipate you could, could come up um, if you try to uh, do digital disclosure or tender evidence in the digital form in a joint court, please. Um, I can't see the participant here. One second, but if you want to speak to this, please indicate by raising your right hand uh, by ind indicate by using the uh, the emoji. Like I said, this is part of the interactive session that we are going to, uh, uh, of this presentation. Please, please raise up your right, raise up your hand, indicate if you want us, if you want, if you have any opinion on this. Okay. While you, you are still thinking about it, I will just go through some of the disclosure challenges that may occur. Um, in this, some of the disclosures challenges that may occur. One of one of the disclosure challenges that will occur uh, is that of preservation of data. How do you preserve the data, particularly data that is coming from someone that is uh, that is not totally well versed in electronic documents? Please, in one minute, please share with us your experience. In one minute, please. Admin, please, can you allow Ambassador Nodja to speak? Please omit yourself, Ambassador Nodja. Hello, good afternoon. 
Hello? Good afternoon. We can hear you. We can hear you. Good afternoon. Please Good afternoon, go ahead. Doc. Thank you very much for a very beautiful work done. Uh, the, one of the challenges um, that, that I have noticed that um, uh, the culture of uh, our security people, security people, not allowing somebody uh, to take digital evidence, is uh, a very big problem in our in our environment. And uh, I wonder how that will be handled. So like a, like a judicial panel of inquiry on um, police brutality that was going on, um, I, I tried to take some picture and um, uh, it, it caused some problem uh, in the court there because I need the evidence as I report to back up some things. So some people, the warders that came with somebody from the prison, and from, uh, they say, they took my phone and I say, they said I must delete, they check the whole thing, they say I must delete the picture. Why should I snap? Why should I snap them? So uh, this is one of the areas where we will have difficulty. Even when we go for election, if you are not careful, sometimes even our journalists, their cameras have been smashed and broken. So that is one of very big challenge. What do, what do we do about that? Thank you, sir. Okay. Well, thank you, uh, I think what you are seeing is um, um, falls under the category of access to public uh, proceeding, uh, being able to uh, video uh, public proceeding. Um, and I think that it's something that uh, in different countries, the way they handle it is different. Um, it's public, if it's a public proceeding, um, you, can, you can record it, but most times they don't allow people um, to take videos. Um, without authorization. So, uh, but in terms of, so they don't allow people to, except people to seek authorization from the judges. That is one part of it. But what I'm concerned about is this part of where you see um, a crime occurring, someone is being kidnapped or a theft happening and you use your phone um, to take videos and then you send that video uh, to the police or to the prosecutor and trying to introduce that into evidence when it gets to court and court struggles with it and say it's not authentic, um, it's not reliable, it's been enhanced and so on and so forth like that. So that is what I, 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 I'm thinking that might be an issue. But what you are saying is an issue, but it's not really uh, it's within the judicial prerogative how they want to proceed. Uh, but again, you can hold the judiciary accountable by saying, if the proceedings are public, anybody can use their phone, provided you can do it in an orderly and in an orderly manner. Um, I see Ms. Ms. Um, Aruna, Sandra Aruna, one minute, I'm looking at time. Uh, we have, but I will just allow her to speak. And then we'll, Ms. Aruna, please, and then we'll proceed. Ms. Aruna, please. Yeah, good afternoon. Good afternoon. I can you hear me, please? Yes, I can hear you. Please go ahead. All right. I think generally, I think because the citizens' lives are not being protected enough, it's difficult for someone to come out. Probably I record something with my phone and evidence, and I send it probably to police mm -hmm. on a particular uh, crime that took place. And when it's time mm -hmm. to go to court, I'm being called to come and testify openly. What was what, the guarantee that my life is safe afterwards? Because something happened recently during the EDSAS protest. As soon as they broke the jail, somebody that came to court to come and testify against person, the image when they are killed the person on the spot. Mm. That's also a factor that, that needs to be considered. So if I know that my life is not safe at the end because I just want to testify over a particular stuff, I won't. Because even the freedom of speech is not free. I think that's a factor that we need to look into. That's the reason why you don't see people come out to testify. Even if they have the evidence, they will say, I beg, right. let me just keep this thing to myself. Right, right. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 and that, thanks for that service, Arida. And that is a very important question on the important point, rather, that you mentioned. And I think this also falls into the aspect of victim protection, not victim protection, that I'm not sure that laws has provision into in, in place for. If you want citizens citizens to bring to be active 
uh, policing agent in terms of being responsible, be your brother's keepers and so on and so forth. You have to provide mechanism for them to tender evidence in a way that it will be safe for them. But it's, it's complex. And I think our laws have not caught up. I don't think I, I, if I, I don't think there's any previous provisions. Please, if you have any provision that says that victims can be protected when they are um, providing evidence or giving evidence, introducing evidence um, in court, in open court, please let me know. But I think there's no rooms or regulation regarding that. Uh, I'm looking at the time we have to move forward. Um, please, um, if you have other challenges, just please put it in the chat so that all of everybody can read it. The chat book is right open before me here now. One second, I think I moved too fast. Sorry. Okay, let's move to these. So uh, before we go further, this is a case review that I want to look at. This is a case review that I want us to read. Please, everyone, if you can read it, that would be great. I'll read it for the sake of those that are just listening. I will now see the screen. Um, So here are the facts of the case. An undercover agent videotaped a popular Nollywood actor sexually assaulting a minor. And the videotape was digitalized and the images of the defendant were subjected to what is called a computer enhancement and printed as single images. A copy of the original videotape was entered as an exhibit at trial as well as a copy of the single computer enhanced image of the defendant. Um, defendant. Um, the issue is this, do you think the trial court will held in admitting the computer enhanced images? Um, if, you've, uh, if you are raising up your hand, I believe that you are trying to answer this question. So if you're not answering this question, uh, please put down your hand. But if I'm going to call you now, if you are ready to answer this case review um, question, So if you don't want to answer uh, by reason of your hand, by reason of your hand, uh, please uh, write to answer uh, in the chat box for everybody to see. So uh, let me start with uh, Ms. Hope Aruna or Mr. Aruna, please. Can we call Mr. Aruna or Ms. Aruna? Ms. Aruna, yes, good afternoon, please. Sorry, I was about to take down my hand. I wanted to comment on the earlier question. So I have, I've sent in okay. my question in as a chat. So let me take down my hand. Okay, uh, let me see your question. There's a problem with certificate of authentication where when you're a teacher, it doesn't make question of nature. Yes, uh, uh, I will talk about that in, in a moment. I will talk about that in a moment. Well, we'll get to certificate of authentication. I'll talk about that in a moment. Don't worry, I'll talk about that. Um, Ambassador Noja, you want to speak again? Please let Ambassador Noja speak. And I say Mr. Uh, Ms. Aruna again wants to speak. Uh, one more minute, please. We are looking at this case review. We are looking at this case review. Advice on Onoja, please. Admin, admin, please. Can you allow Ambassador Onoja to speak? Ms. Aruna, unmute yourself. Okay. You need to unmute yourself. Okay. You are now muted again. 
Hello? Hello, can you hear me now? We can hear you. Okay, thank you very much. I, I, I do not think that uh, the judge uh, does not err in admitting that evidence because uh, the original video is available. The enhancement is just to a, a kind of a, make uh, somebody be able to get a, a, a proper digital interpretation. Since the original video is there, it will not, it will not be, 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 be wrong for the judge to admit that uh, in the case. That is what I think. Supposing the original video was not there and it was just an enhanced video they sent, then I can say he will err by admitting because we can do anything with the digital now. Right, right. Thank you, uh, uh, thank you Ambassador Roger. And that is an important point that you made. As long as the original video is still there, only enhancement can be done. So take for instance, if you receive a satellite imagery about a location in Northern Nigeria, and the, the, the imageries are not that great in terms of, and the enhance it applies some, um, some photographic or uh, digital manipulation to not manipulate to change the contact, but just to make sure that you can see it, it can still be admissible. And that was what happened in this case. And the judge really ad rightly admitted it. So I, I moved now. So admissibility, and I'm looking at time now, so we might need to move at a fast rate, but it's still going to be interactive. Um, there are certain legal and technical requirements which must be met to ensure the admissibility of digital evidence in a court of law in Nigeria. And I want us to understand that digital evidence is a subcategory. When we talk about scientific evidence, digital evidence, uh, they are all is a subcategory of documentary evidence. So the rules that apply to documentary evidence in our evidence act still applies to it. But the recent changes in the uh, uh, in this evidence in 2011 um, actually made a category, a particular session uh, for the absence of computer generated document in proceeding in Nigeria. And it's governed by section 84 of the evidence act. And it again, in essentially, it compares computer generated statement as similar to direct oral evidence direct oral evidence. Don't forget that. And we're going to talk about that later on. And also, if you look at section 258 of the Evidence Act, um, it covers um, computer generated document, which includes books, maps, plans, photograph, videos, disk tapes, etc. Um, provided they were derived from any device used for storing and processing uh, information. I'm pulling out the pool here, and I would like to answer I would like to answer to this. Um, based on this particular session of the evidence that I've, uh, I just spoke about, what do you think will be the answer to this? Please look at your screen. And um, sorry about the error. It shouldn't be Canada. It should be satellite imageries. Ignore this Canada, please. Please answer, I want more engagement, I want more engagement, I want more engagement. Please answer, answer. Please look at your screen and answer this. More engagement, please. Why are you answering that? Um, Section 84, 2 and 4 of the Evidence Act provides for the precondition for admissibility of a statement contained in a document produced by a computer. Um, if you look at section 84, 4, um, provides in a proceeding where it is desired uh, to give a statement in evidence by virtue of this section, a certificate. And I think uh, Ms. Aruna mentioned the issue of certificate as uh, something that. Um, Um, a certificate identifying document containing the statement and describing the manner in which it was produced, giving such particulars of any device involved in the production of that document as may be appropriate for the purposes uh, for purpose of showing that the document was produced by a computer dealing with any matters to which the condition mentioned in subsection two above relate and purporting to be signed by a person occupying a responsive position uh, 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 in, uh, 
responsible position in relation to the operation of the relevant device or the management of the relevant activities as the case may be. The import of the above position is just, is just, is just so that once a statement is contained in a document, which is produced by a computer. It has to pass through the order and fulfill the condition of admissibility cons containing section 841, 842, and 844 of the Evidence Act. Yes, it has to be, once you produce it, you have the digital evidence, you have to make a manual and then uh, authenticate it that the manual, the manual ones that you are printing um, is a reflection of the digital one by certificate. And the construct of that certificate is so different. And that's what we said. I was saying in the sense that we don't know what is the former way of certificate. And in most litigation regarding digital evidence in Nigeria, most of us have argued, filed preliminary objection on the ground that the certificate was not validly executed. But here's an interesting part about this thing. It's not only a certificate that you can do it. You can also call all right evidence. Uh, the evidence that also provides something that um, Ambassador Noja mentioned, he said, he said he, which he said uh, was that what happens, uh, it's possible for things to be manipulated. And when you deal with digital evidence, that reality is, is, is a reality where things could be manipulated, um, say, for example, by hackers. So, what, what is going to be the legal recourse or challenge to the absolutely of those manipulated computer statements? Um, in, if you look at this uh, statement I put on the on the slide, it talks about uh, in uh, Okubo versus Dixkin, um, the Supreme Court said that a party that seeks to tender a computer generated document needs to do more than just tendering same from the bar. Evidence relating to the use of the computer must be called to establish the conditions set out under Section 842. Uh, uh, Therefore, even if you certify it and say this is what it's called, it does not say that other rules of evidence applicable to admissibility of documentary evidence, such as authenticity, relevance, and admissibility in law based on the evidence art is excluded. You still have to do more to that. And in the rest, um, I'm going to provide, um, 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 uh, I'm going to bring also um, in uh, the Supreme Court of Nigeria in this thing versus Sevilla, like I proved there, uh, like I put on the slide, said that proof that the computer is reliable can be provided in either two ways, by calling or evidence or by tendering a written uh, um, certificate. So, and again, if you deal with geospatial technology and satellite images, drone, um, you need, most likely you need to call a, 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 an expert evidence to come and speak to it, how they get the image, how the image was extracted from the drone or from the satellite and how it was transported and how it was preserved and all those kind of uh, chain of uh, custody must be established. And I believe my colleague, uh, Ms. Iris, will speak more about that in the way they've used it in an uh, international framework. I've done that already. And the answer is correct. Everybody says, um, I've shared the result. The answer is correct. It, it is, it can be termed computer generated um, document based on section 258 of the Evidence Act that covers computer generated document, which includes books, math, um, photograph, etc. And the next portion of my presentation will be devoted to the intricate issues raised by geospatial technologies and how they can be admitted to evidence. Um, for authenticity, that is the first thing that has to do. Uh, one second. Sorry. One of the threshold issues that can arise with digital evidence is authenticity, which is usually taken for granted with physical evidence. But the digitalization of information has made it much easier for data to be altered or altered rather or doctored. Therefore, before such evidence is ad admitted, the court will often have to ask, is this document or record what it actually proposed um, to represent? 
And answering this will not, will, answer this will not determine the ultimate admissibility. Um, even an authentic document can be inadmissible portion to other evidential rules like ESA evidence that we know. But authenticity is actually necessary precondition to uh, admissibility. And we all know in that basic um, law of evidence that the onus lies on the person trending the digital evidence, the scientific evidence to establish its authenticity. Um, and also in determining the authenticity of digital evidence, the court will critically examine the digital forensic tool, forensic procedures and tools used to extract, to preserve and analyze those digital evidence. The digital um, laboratory where those analyses are performed, the report of digital forensic analysis and the technical and academic qualification of the digital forensic analysis and expert witnesses if required. That is also part of the things that has to be done. I know that this might not be done in Nigeria, but in, in but again, by the time we mature in the use of digital evidence, um, in, in using digital evidence for locating missing persons, sometimes these are challenges that has to be overcome before the court can deem um, an evidence or um, an image, image that comes from a satellite or that we can say came from the satellite um, to be authentic. And also it is important to mention this fact that digital evidence can also be authenticated, not just by direct evidence, maybe by the, um, the person that created the uh, video, but also by circumstantial evidence. And if you look at uh, digital imageries, that is where it falls. Under circumstantial evidence, we can use it looking at, looking at in, across time, uh, across time frame. Um, this, this set of people came to this location on social day, they return on social days, and we can link it up using legal analysis and, and they are about. And as lawyers, no matter what, as a tendering scientific evidence in Nigerian court, um, you need to consider both the admissibility and also the weight when deciding on manner of proof. Like we said, it can, it might be, it might not be admissible, but if you make it admissible, the weight to be applied, a proper weight must be applied to it. If no proper weight is applied to it, then it's not worth it. It's just like you wasted them. Uh, mm. It's just like you, it, it, let's move forward. Um, here's the thing that says circumstantial evidence may be sufficient to clear the order of authenticity for the purpose of admissibility, but if direct evidence can be adduced, it should be adduced. And just like one of our participants said, and when you as a citizen make videos uh, or post something, and if it's your video, it's really good for you to come to the court to testify that this is what I saw, this is what I document as a direct evidence, but also subject to safety concerns and security concerns. So I'm running through, I know I say I'm out of time, I'm running through this point. Please, I just wanted to look at the autistic checklist I, I've created for people. This PowerPoint slide is going to be um, shared to everyone. So if I'm not able to cover everything that needs to cover today, be rest assured that you get a, a copy of the PowerPoint slide and you can read further and go through it. So here are the checklist that you need to look at. Can I put this evidence to an expert? Um, this technology, this new technology that's being used to locate me missing persons in Nigeria. Do I need an expert for it? Um, is the expert qualified to obtain the evidence directly from his sources? Um, the person who persuaded in the creation of the digital evidence, you know, can you call them by calling out or uh, email or in true examination in chief or cross examination? Um, can I establish a chain of continuity um, so that um, I can negate any concerns of tampering? That is also one of the major concerns we've identified here. Um, can the forensic experts testify that there's no evidence of tampering? These are some of the things that we have to do to uh, do that. So let's go forward. I'm looking. We are time is going. Also, we look at the best evidence rule. One second, we'll go back a little bit. Um, closely related to the issue of autism is the best evidence rule. And again, for lawyers that are in admits, you understand what is meant by best evidence rule. If you look at the physical evidence, um, the best evidence rule is thought as requiring the original document to be adduced if, this, if it exists. And that's why we see, see people bringing cutlass to court to show um, the judge that this cutlass was used to kill um, someone. Uh, but that doesn't really work um, in, in, in the case of uh, digital evidence because it's unclear. How do you determine um, who uh, the original of a, of a computer? Um, so in this case, the best evidence is described as seeking to ensure 
uh, an electronic document, electronic document offered in court to greatly reflect the original information that was put into that um, document. And it, again, like I said, yeah, the case law in different jurisdictions is not agreed on the applicability of the best evidence um, rule as when you look at it um, to digital evidence. Um, um, okay, let's quickly do this case, um, expert evidence case studies, please, please, let's quickly look at it. Uh, this is very important, please, let's quickly look at it. Um, it talks about, please, let's quickly look at it. Uh, one minute, if you want to speak about it, just indicate, um, and I'm more than happy to call you. Please look at it. Please look at it um, so that we can. So, someone, Arena, da -da, uh, mobile network. Uh, so, for uh, Miss Arena, for WhatsApp messages, emails, and SMS, I see the phone being tendered. Who is the right person to sign the certificate? Uh, I, I think the practices are very different. I think I heard from someone um, that the person, uh, the person um, that that owns the phone is the one that will sign that the content are correct. So the WhatsApp messages, email, and SMS that is being printed out, it's it's my own because he's the owner of that uh, uh, of that information. But if you look at if you are looking at cell cell um some cell location, what what will you call it? Cell location whereby there's a communication between your phone and the cell towers. And it's bumping, showing how this person was moving from point A to point B to point C to point D. Um, I think the best person will be the uh, MTN uh, or the mobile providers to be the one that will that will sign that certificate of authentication that um, they can based on the pin the pinging of that person's cell uh, um, cell um, location cell location by GPS. Um, that um, that is it. Okay, so we have this as part of evidence case studies. Um, So what are the issues that you think? Um, what are the issues that you think uh, are triggered by this? Aminat Olubunla was murdered in a home in 2020, according to his arrest warrant. Her husband Adaju provided an elaborate explanation of the day's event, claiming that they returned home after receiving an alarm alert. Adaju went to claim that upon entering his house, he was immobilized and tortured by an intruder. He told the police that the intruder then shot and killed Aminat and she uh, when she returned home from the church. Relying on evidence collected from Aminat Fitbit, um, I think all of us know Fitbit, police were able to show that she had been in the house at the time that Adaju said she was at the church. According to Fitbit data, Aminat stopped moving one minute before the house alarm went up. So, here are the key takeaways for this. I did not see any answers or anything answers. Um, because of advances in technology, wearables devices like uh, Fitbit, um, like Apple Watch, um, like uh, uh, Samsung uh, Watch, uh, monitor locations via GPS, and uh, activities like distance travel, step taking, um, the time you slept, and heart rate. Uh, the, the, these devices are configured to synchronize data to applications on smartphones and personal computers or to cloud or social media sites. Um, so, Evidentiary collection can be made from either of these sources using standard digital forensic tools and technique. And experts might be called to come and explain to the court how the information, how the information was collated in terms of um, how the information passes from Aminat's body to Fitbit, from Fitbit that she was wearing and to the um, satellite imagery to the GPS and how it was shared on social media. And that might be something that is difficult uh, for judges um, to know. Um, I'm moving. A, a, I'm moving fast here. I want us to know that there's a concept of judicial notice that applies to digital evidence. What do I mean by concept of judicial notice? It's not everything that has to do with um, the, um, digital evidence that you need to call an expert. Experts are useful. Scientific evidence might need expert insight. But certain, take for instance, the use of how to use Facebook. I don't think you need an expert to come and tell a judge in Nigeria how to use Facebook. Except the judge is an archaic and old judge or how the how phone operate, or how you send text messages. You don't need an expert to that. That is a notorious act that the, the judges uh, should be familiar with. But when it 
also issue of GSP, GS, uh, um, G, uh, GPS or remote sensing or drone usage and so on and so forth to capture images and to trans, you know, uh, to store images, you might need expert opinion uh, to understand for the trial fact to understand that. And here's, I, I just summarized that, that point to Ross. And here's the thing, interestingly, um, Nigerian Evidence Act uh, 2011 do not require expert evidence for digital evidence, expert, you know, expert witnesses for digital evidence. So we don't, there's no requirement that for every digital um, evidence that has been brought to court, you need to bring an expert. It didn't say so. He only mentioned certificate of, um, um, certificate of, um, certificate. There's also the issue of ESA evidence that might come here, and I will run through this because of time, um, um, because digital evidence, you know, involves computer-generated data, scientific evidence to involve computer-generated data that's been presented um, to the court for its content. EF, ESA evidence, uh, you have to decide what, know, uh, what the exceptions to yes uh, that is applicable. We all know that yes is an out-of-court statement that's adduced for the truth of its content where there's no opportunity for a contemporaneous uh, course examination of the possible uh, because of the danger to the fairness or the truth-seeking function of a trial fact. Um, Electronic records, including scientific evidence, also often contain statements that are made by out of court uh, declarant. Um, they are dues uh, for the content of their, for the truth of their content. Uh, take, for example, we use your special technology that say that Bukhara went to this location, the military went to this location, found at this location. And so the, 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 uh, you cannot, you cannot, you cannot cross examine uh, a computer uh, uh, image. I but we want also, also want to be careful here or note some important points. One point is that sometimes computer generated data, uh, you know, that by, by virtue of its own operation, is said, and it has times the dates, the date and timestamp attached to an email. Therefore, it's a set an email to a friend, it will see the timeline. So that cannot be, it's not manipulated, we can see clearly. And most times GPS location to GPS remote sensing and satellite images also contain those, those timelines that, um, um, that can be, um, that can be used, that is useful. Um, one second. Where computer generated data do not qualify, uh, it does qualify as ESA, then an ESA exception we have to apply before that evidence can be admitted. And here, what, what are we looking at here? Uh, I will just, I won't go deep into this. We, we all know the three ESA exceptions, um, the, uh, 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 the party admitting, uh, party admission exception, the business record so everyone to look at it and the, the, my teaching notes are there so that you can understand this further. Um, I need to move forward now, one second. So um, if you look at the probative value, the admission of any piece of evidence is important only because of the probative value that that evidence will carry before the trial. Fact, like I said, there's no need admitting an evidence, a piece of digital evidence, scientific evidence, if the trial of fact is not going to portion up the, the correct probative value to it. So in this case, I, I will quickly mention, talk about these three things or the four things. Actually, I will stop on three. I won't talk about the last one using digital evidence in cyber crimes. In the notes, in the PowerPoint, you will see it. But I'll, talk, I'll stop at identification, geo, geo, cell phone, geolocation, character, and credibility of digital um, evidence. So. Um, so digital evidence and scientific evidence can be probative in resolving identity, especially when the evidence consists of a video. Remember, the, we have this problem with creator of eyewitnesses identification. 
um, as we, you know, we all know about it, where memories are not sharp again, um, where you might misplace two people to look alike uh, when they are not the same. And, uh, and, but this is not a problem when the identity of the perpetrator is captured by video. Um, you know, we won't have this sort of identity problem, provided that video is not manipulated and it's not a deep fake video. Um, and again, the weight to be given to video evidence depends on the degree of clarity, the quality of the video. Again, Baba Disha, as an example, remember? And also, let's bring about there's a case law that I wanted to mention here. You remember in the case of Alu 4, the Alu 4, uh, the four students of the University of Port Harcourt that were lynched by a mob in uh, Port Harcourt. Um, some people, some persons in the crowd used their mobile telephone to record the incident and the video was uploaded to YouTube. The prosecution sought to tender the YouTube videos of the lynching, but the defense objected to its admissibility. I don't know if you are following, if you were following that case. The court overruled the objection and admitted the YouTube video download, stating that the video, irrespective of the source, was every admissible in evidence based on its relevance um, to the trial. Photo, photograph can also uh, be relevant to identification. And if you look at social media now, everybody lives their life through Facebook, Instagram, and you know, people are more open to share so much information about themselves, even their previous location that we can use to do that. Um, then we look at um, pervasive value cell phone um, geolocation. location. Um, again, this type of this, like we, we talk, spoke, talked about, this type of then, emanating from cell phone can also assist in identifying the last location of a missing person and perpetrator. And this is something that has been heavily used in Nigeria to locate missing person all over the place. Um, and also in linking the perpetrator and, uh, and the accused to the location of crime, crime at the relevant time. Uh, please, do you remember, uh, I think we should remember this case of this guy is in Enugu, that the lady that went to look for a job um, that uh, went to look for a job that was murdered, that sadly was killed some few months ago. It was your cell phone geolocation that was used to nab the guy, that was used to connect him to someone in Abuja, a high ranking person in Abuja. And everyone in Nigeria has access to. So that it's a good mine um, for, uh, that is a good mine for law enforcement and is being used by active, even by private citizens um, regarding that. So, one second. One second. So, in terms of um, digital probative value, character, and credibility, digital evidence can also be useful in assessing the character and credibility of a witness. Okay. Um, it is well established, uh, it's well established that a witness other than a, a, an accused can be examined on his character as a means of challenging that person's credibility. And if you use um, data from the internet, um, from Facebook, from Instagram, from social um, social media, even from um, GPS, you can use that to say that this person is a bad person, or even locate their, know their last location and uh, and use that. And again, in this day, you don't need to hire a private investigator. Um, to try to know whether someone is a good person or a bad person. Images, satellite images, so many things can be used um, to do that. Um, there's something that I wanted to talk about. Um, I will look for it. I said I'm not going to talk about this, but I will talk briefly about something. Um, uh, yes, and also the use of uh, metadata. So that's what I wanted to talk about here. Uh, one second. Uh, the use of metadata as evidence of, um, uh, as evidence in court. So you remember, and this is where I'm going to wrap up on this point, and then I quickly in five minutes rush through the, the slides on the uh, courtroom presentation. Remember the story of Reno Mokri? Remember when he was uh, President Jonathan's uh, special advisor on new media? Uh, uh, and it, it, that particular story, I'm bringing it here because it demonstrates the utility of electronic evidence and the forensic analysis that was conducted on it to determine where that particular piece of information um, came from. Remember, it was the metadata behind the data that exposed that Mr. or Pastor Mercury, either way, which one we call it, uh, that exposed Pastor Mercury when he tried to undermine the former Central Bank of Nigeria governor, Sanusi Lamido. Uh, you know, what did the Reverend Reno uh, Mercury did? He did he use a pseudonym when they're similar. And he sent an email with an address called when they send me at yahoo.com. 
uh, and they sent an email around um, February 26, 2014 to several media organizations and bloggers. The email sought to create a credible and logical chain of event between the suspension of the former governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, um, Malam Sanusi, Lamido Sanusi, and the recent and the upsurge in terrorist attack in the northern northeast of Nigeria. And what he did was to try to paint the former CBA governor as a major financier of Boko Haram and a veteran uh, terrorist. You know, so what he did was remember Sanusi place of last place of work was at the Federal Reserve Bank of Nigeria, where was the you know the is it the CEO uh, before becoming the CBA governor. Reno Omoki tried to link him to Alaji Umaru Abdul Mutalab, who you remember was the chairman. Uh, when uh, Sanusi was the CEO of the bank. And if you remember too, Alaji Mutalab is, was also the father of uh, Umar Farouk Mutalab, popularly referred to as the underwear bomber, who was convicted of an attempt, uh, attempt uh, of attempting to detonate plastic uh, explosive uh, eating his underwear uh, while on a, on a plane in the US space some years back, I think that was 2009, uh, 2009, uh, one second, 2000, one second, please, this is moving too fast. 2000 and uh, I think it was 2009. And it was, one second please. One second, please. So what he tried to do was when the simile, which is Omokri now, he tried to portray um, um, Alaji Mutalab, the father, as a terrorist, hoping that the father's previous relationship uh, with Sanusi would make his argument more credible. But by the time they analyzed, did a, um, by the time they did a forensic analysis of the metadata of the document attached by this so-called simile in the email, the email came out that Reno, in the email, the name Reno Mokri came up in the author. And if you look at your Word document, you also see that part where you, the author is there. You will know, but there's an author in the metadata in your Word document, any Word document you generated. And in that, it also showed the type of computer that you used to send that email. And not only that, it revealed the IP address for which that email was sent, and it shows that the email was sent. Uh, from Kubra uh, in Abuja by Galaxy, Galaxy by a phone called Galaxy Blackbone. And also the internet service provider that was used to send, was used to send that email was the internet hosting services for the federal court of Nigeria. And that was how uh, uh, Sanusi was able to run, you know, get go score free. So that shows the utility of embracing digital document, digital evidence, and also embracing um, doing forensic, thorough forensic analysis. And I'm saying this for the sake of defense counsel that are here that have issues with EFCC or with other things. You just don't accept. There's things that you need to do, um, that forensic analysis that you need to do that you can't just take for granted. I've shown you of one success story of where that forensic is. Um, let me just conclude there uh, with, I'll ask a simple question here, uh, and then we'll conclude this presentation in one minute, please. Um, my apologies that I've spent, I've gone over the time. We have this last poll, please, 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 please. Um, please look at it and please tell me. Um, um, and in, in this case, please, if you want to speak, raise up your hand and, and then I'll be more than happy to call you. Please look at it. I'm, I'm, I'm being encouraged by the responses. I'm being encouraged by the responses. Okay, okay. Uh, I'm interested to know the challenges of those that have uh, used media 
uh, or detailed presentation to make your case in court. I'll be more than happy to give you the floor for one or two minutes for you to come and uh, for you to speak about your experiences. And also I would like to hear from one person that has not used media or digital presentation um, uh, uh, in court to also tell me why they think that won't work. Please raise up your right hand. I can see Mr. Ovu Odo. Um, I'm going to call you soon, so res you know. Okay. Keep going with the voting. Uh, please add me. Can you allow Mr. Orugo Ovodo to speak? Good day, everyone. Ah, One Mr. of these. My apologies. Yeah, good day. Mm. No problem. Good day, everyone. One of the greatest challenges was the use of data. Most of the time, there was this uh, network issues. And you cannot assess a lot of things due to the network challenge you're actually having. Then your visual also may not really be so good. The quality of the product of the visual may not come out well as you also wanted. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And, uh, and that is a fair point about the challenges where you don't have light 24 seven and being the quality being able not to come out, but that is also an important part. Um, here's what I would say here. Um, Here's what I would say here is the fact that you, so when, say for instance, we come back to your special technologies, satellite imageries and so on and so forth, you need to be able to, there's no way you can print them in a manual form and you'll be able to appreciate them better. You won't. If you look at the imagery, some of the images that my colleague, Ms. Iris posted on the, on, on, shared with us, you find out that it's more quality where you can see the sequence in a digital form and you can project that uh, to code, but I understand that um, um, constraint that you talked about. And it's a real constraint, it's a real constraint. So here's some of the thing in terms of, uh, like I said, in criminal trials, there are certain areas that most commonly and easily support the use of multimedia presentation. It's not every criminal case that you do that you go and bring PowerPoint and start showing it in court, but certain areas are there. Say for instance, there's a complicated science to explain DNA, to explain, explain to the judge how the DNA sequencing is done, the extraction, the matching, and all those things you need, um, you might need a PowerPoint presentation uh, where there's a bulk of evidence in one area that needs to be collected in a digestible format. Is EEG, cell phone data with multiple relevant phone time and location. You might need to do some graphing, uh, some mapping for the court to understand it very well. Other than saying, my Lord, in exhibit one, A, two, B, it's going to be very confusing. So that's also the point. And also the evidence described is in a digital form and is best displayed in a digital presentation since you know like i said satellite imagery is most likely better in a digital uh, presentation so again these are the considerations for councils that you need to look at uh, and i'm going to stop here uh, with my conclusion um yeah if you want to introduce um, um use digital presentation uh, we have to make a decision between the fact that um the, the out, they are not evidence you cannot in include uh, new evidence in your digital presenter, in your PowerPoint slide, you can't sneak in evidence, no matter how much your PowerPoint looks good. It has to be for submission purposes only. And there's, that decision is important. So yes, yeah, we need to look at this, uh, uh, but if you want it, um, what is in, um, if you want to see your PowerPoint to be admitted as evidence, then you have to look at it, is it relevant, is it reliable? Again, back to the evidential pressure that you need to make. Uh, with the introduction be into the evidence be prejudicial to the accused or the trial process, there's a probative value at where any prejudice with the introduction of the presentation as evidence affect trial fairness. Um, in conclusion, sorry, one second. So as technology is continuing to go at an alarming rate and you know permit every aspect of our lives.
every aspect of our life, the Nigerian courts and judges and stakeholders, every stakeholders, uh, we need, we have to be mindful of how they apply, um, how they apply, and in some cases, how they adapt the spare provisions of digital evidence in the Law of Evidence Act 2011. Like I said, it's very sparse. If I look at the ACJ Act, the issue of digital evidence did not even come up other than video, uh, giving testimony by video. Uh, to the phenomena of uh, that does not exist a new um, geospatial technology that would transcend the rigid contours of the known evidentiary rules. Expert witnesses will continue to be important in the cases of complex or obscured technology, especially where we use new special technologies to locate missing persons. In the narrative in being constructed in that case, you need expert opinion to be able to make knowledge of it. And one of the trainings we also have uh, part of the series of conversation we have here, we also um, talk about it. And also in conclusion, I think there's also a need to update the evidence act to capture new threshold on digital evidence. And also there's a need to need to frequently update our legislation, including our criminal code, the ACJA and other acts to make sure that they are further aligned um, to our times and the technological revolution that is going on there. Uh, if you need more information, here is my contact details. Please take it, and it's also going to be this PowerPoint that we're going to share, and I'll be more than happy to engage with you outside of this forum. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Ogbe. Thank you, Dr. Ogbe. I would ask the floor to my Thank colleague. I think we have a key name here, and then my colleague will come on board. If there are uh, questions, uh, we can you can take those questions while I'm sharing my screen to get started. Yes, Ayodele, there are some questions on the chat box. I don't know whether you want to take a look at them. Okay. Uh, okay, I see one from Mr. Ogunshola. One second. He said, is video evidence of a crisis and obtained through YouTube admissible? Um, if, if, if it is reliable and if it passes the authenticity test, I think it's admissible. Again, it's going to be, um, I think it, should, it will be admissible if, as provided it passes the authenticity test, provided it's not, it, 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 it's not a, a deep fake, it's not a fake document, and it can be verified. And most importantly, it can be supported you know, by, uh, by a witness um, under cross examination. It can, it, it will be maybe someone that says I was, I was in that group. I was there when that video was being recorded. I'm not the owner of that video, but I was there. I saw the event. I can narrate it and provide corroborating um, evidence. Yes, it will be admissible. Um, what else again? One second. For WhatsApp messages, I said, it well. okay, I've answered that. Dr. Olubo, I think I've answered all the questions there. Except if I missed any, which you can identify for me. No, I don't think there's anyone there. Are, people are congratulating you for a good job. Well done. So, <laughs> thank um, you. Thank you. Uh, there is over to you, I guess. Okay. Oh. One moment. I'm just trying to um, share the screen. There we go. Okay. So uh, I, thank you. I, that was an excellent presentation. And uh, my presentation will go much more quickly because uh, you've already covered some of the key issues. So uh, when we talk about the rules governing scientific evidence and, and geospatial 
technologies evidence in international courts and tribunals, the first thing to understand is that there are two different types of courts. Uh, there are um, two, two different types of human rights courts. The first are the criminal courts. Uh, most people know of the International Criminal Court, the ICC, but there are other types of hybrid criminal courts, uh, international courts as well. And then there are international human rights courts. These are uh, the regional courts. They are not judging criminal culpability of an individual defendant. That's the job of the criminal courts. They're investigating charges against an individual perpetrator of the crimes over which those courts have jurisdiction. The international human rights courts are hearing judging, uh, assessing, interpreting the human rights obligations of the governments that are members of that court. So uh, I'll be focusing today on the African court on human and people's rights. Uh, but just as, as just so you know, some of the examples I'll use come from the other regions uh, that have similar human rights court systems. So here's a side-by-side -side comparison. The International Criminal Court, the ICC, it's established by a treaty. It has jurisdiction over very specific crimes that are established by that treaty. International criminal, uh, uh, international crimes such as crimes against humanity, war crimes, genocide. Uh, they are looking at individual criminal accountability the complaints are brought by the prosecutor and they use a blend of common law and civil law, which are, um, it's because you have countries that are part of that, that court that have both uh, many, both of those types of law. And so it needs to accommodate all of the different systems of law. Because it's individual criminal accountability, it's required that the prosecutor prove the specific intent of the defendant to commit that crime. By comparison within the African court on human and people's rights, that's established by the pro a protocol of the African charter and it has jurisdiction over all human rights, all of the treaties that the uh, countries that have signed on to that protocol that are members of the court, uh, have that they have accepted as their governmental obligations. The complaints are brought by the African Commission. For some countries, a few countries, those complaints can also be brought by NGOs, uh, but Nigeria has not accepted that, uh, that process, so I won't focus on that at all. Uh, the court has wide judicial discretion to accept not only um, evidence, but also the different types of cases. It can also take on advisory opinions, not just specific complaints about specific instances. So very broad discretion and opportunities to bring different human rights uh, cases before the court. And so this is a different kind of proof. It's you're trying, when there's a case in front of the African court, the, the question is to prove a pattern of violations committed by the government, that the government has failed, not just in necessarily one instance, but in a series of instances or in a broad failure of policy, uh, failed to uphold human rights. It's very different than the uh, than a criminal case in the ICC. And so the kinds of evidence that you're bringing forward that that some are used in these different cases uh, are quite different in in many ways. The purpose of them is quite different. We, probative value is uh, still a an important concept at the ICC. I'm going to talk about the criminal cases first. I just wanted to make that distinction to ensure that that there's clarity between them. Uh, the International Criminal Court, its rules uh, require admission of evidence to uh, have probative value. It does not 
accept or uh, embrace, adopt any particular country's rules on evidence. It has to be open to all of the rules, but some of these concepts are, are the same. And so uh, there isn't necessarily a conflict between Nigerian law on admission of evidence, uh, but the fact that something is consistent with Nigerian laws of evidence doesn't mean that it will automatically be admitted at the ICC. Um, the, uh, the definition is very similar to uh, what's already been discussed in Nigerian law. Authenticity and reliability uh, need to be proved as well. In the case of geospatial technologies, as I said earlier, the International Criminal Court has relied on uh, satellite imagery and remote sensing analysis of that uh, remotely sensed data to, uh, in, in many cases. And um, they are used in those cases for um, uh, to, in, in the context of all of the other evidence. And so reliability, authenticity are often proved by the, the other evidence, the corroboration between other evidence and the geospatial evidence and vice versa. That the, um, when eyewitness testimony reinforces what the geospatial images are uh, indicating, that that's an indication of reliability. Uh, and geospatial uh, images are often used to prove that other kinds of evidence are reliable. Um, that includes metadata, the time such as the timestamps on emails and videos. Uh, Geospatial technology, because it has it itself, can be authenticated. It can be authenticated by uh, understanding the source of the images, the calibration of the satellites. All of the satellites are subject to international law and uh, in the United States to US licensing agreements. And so there are standards for how those images are collected and transmitted. And so that can all be used to um, not only prove the authenticity of the satellite imagery, but also other data that can be connected to it such as uh, GPS data connected to a video, such as a timestamp on an email or a Facebook post or things like that. The European Court of Justice has said that uh, the capture of images by remote sensing cannot as such be regarded as unreliable. Uh, so it has been, geospatial technologies have been accepted uh, in good faith by the European Court of Justice, the, um, and several of the other courts um, and human rights courts around the world. Um, but th there still is the matter of um, interpreting and understanding the, the weight of the imagery. Um, it's important to understand that satellite images are not photographs, they're not videos, they have to be processed and interpreted. It is um, generally not possible to determine when an, an image has been altered, but it can be documented and, uh, and explained by an expert who understands how the images have been altered you can't necessarily tell just by looking at the image itself. And um, this is why the opinion of an expert is often required for admitting satellite images and remote sensed uh, analysis, data analysis. That means that uh, an expert witness is in international courts is almost always the way in which the geospatial uh, evidence is brought into court. The expert testifies on um, their qualifications and uh, what kind of experience they have in order to uh, download the, the, the data 
analyze it using specialized software, interpret what that analysis is saying, is it indicating, and explain it in a way that a lay person can understand, someone who is not um, a technologist can understand and can connect it to the other evidence that's before the court. The International Criminal Court has, uh, this has been its practice uh, in part because testimony, personal testimony is, pref is a preferred form of evidence, but also because that means you can uh, bring it to the court and the court can better understand and ask questions, interrogate. As was said, you have the right to question the evidence and the defense attorneys then can question the, uh, the findings of the expert, the conclusions in a way you just can't with a, a printout or a report. Um, this, this enables not only better understanding of the evidence, but a more fair process because it makes the, the information and the evidence um, more accessible to everyone in a way that is supporting justice. Um, the, the court can bring in, it has the, uh, the ICC has the jurisdiction, the authority to appoint an expert, even if neither of the parties bring that expert forward to interpret scientific evidence. That's an important point to, to, um, to keep in mind. And, and um, I know that we're running out of time, so uh, these, these slides will be available as well. Um, so moving on then from the criminal uh, context to human rights courts, um, we'll look at the rule for evidence in the African Court of Human and People's Rights. Uh, rule 45 has the measures for taking evidence. It is very broad, <laughs> extremely broad. Any evidence that the court believes can clarify the case, the court can hear a witness um, of any witness that it deems likely to assist it in carrying out its task. The court can itself appoint um, or invite a, an opinion, even if no none of the parties in the case, the government, the the complainant, the African Commission, have not specifically suggested that. And um, the court can also assign one of its members to take evidence or investigate on its own. So much broader than the national law in Nigeria. I want to talk a little bit about how geospatial technologies have been used in the different um, human rights courts, again, different from the ICC, which has used it to, um, to identify movements of people, movements of military, um, changes on the ground, including burning villages, uh, documenting time and location of conflicts. Uh, the European Court of Human Rights has uh, used it to document refugee movements and document circumstances uh, relating settlements that are relevant to understanding the right to return. In the case of the refugee movements, that was a case involving um, deportation, whether someone could be deported to, uh, to their country of origin from the UK. And the refugee movements were, were used to show what the current circumstances were in that country. So very different from criminal cases. In the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, uh, scientific evidence has become a critical issue and in and of itself has been upheld as a human right. There is a state obligation to conduct a thorough scientific investigation in the Inter-American system, according to judgments by um, the by the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. And that's in several different countries. It's been reinforced several times in Venezuela and in, in Honduras and Nicaragua. Um, and these have been have been in cases involving mass disappearances, mass graves, uh, disappearances of journalists, disappearances of just um, abductions and kidnappings. 
And importantly, what the Inter-American Court of Human Rights has said is that in cases of disappearances and extrajudicial executions, you do not need to identify the individual victims in order to show that the government has failed its obligation to protect against those. If the, if the, the, the court has evidence that there are systemic violations by the government, a systemic failure to investigate, um, <clears throat> failure to conduct that, that uh, gather the evidence and um, thoroughly um, hold the perpetrators accountable, take every action possible, that in and of itself shows a government failure to, um, to uphold its obligations. You don't need to uh, prove individual circumstances or individual perpetrators the way that you do in a criminal case. And I see that people are raising their hands. I just want to go through this. Uh, it's a short presentation and um, I'm almost done. So I can answer questions afterwards. Um, in the African Court of Human Rights, uh, Human and People's Rights, the um, there is a decision that says the state has an, uh, nations have an obligation to conduct a thorough, rigorous, and independent investigation. There is a right to a thorough investigation that is implicit in the rights to due process and implicit to an effective remedy. These are um, the the parallels to those uh, to those decisions in the Inter-American Court, although in the African Court, the cases that would um, articulate this better, that would provide some precedent for the use of geospatial technologies to document those cases um, have not yet been brought forward. So we don't have um, a lot of precedent in the African Court, but um, those basic standards and understandings of the state obligation to conduct an investigation are, um, are there. So just a few points about that. Um, I want to recommend the recent report by the International Commission of Jurists on the investigation and prosecution of potentially unlawful death. Um, this goes through the forensic process for scientific evidence um, and how to present it in court, including digital technologies. And again, in the human rights courts, scientific expert witnesses are used um, in particular to bring in geospatial evidence, which have been used again to document mass graves, document um, uh, a number of human rights issues it's that testimony and explanation of what the digital evidence means. What is it indicating? How can it be connected to other evidence? That's, that's the role of the scientific expert witness in these cases as well as the criminal cases. So that is um, my, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And um, are, are there questions? Um, that's, that's a really basic overview of how these technologies are used in international human rights courts. And, and um, the, I, I can provide additional details on cases, but um, I wanted to keep it brief because uh, it was obvious from the earlier poll that there was much more interest in um, the, the questions about evidence in Nigeria courts and Nigerian law. So, but I'm happy to explain more if anything was unclear. Yes, um, there's a question. Can we have the slides at the end of the presentation? Yes, we, we will make all of those available. And um, there are uh, one thing I want to recommend to you, and I will put it in the chat here, um, is I'm going to provide a link to a report that uh, the American Association for the Advancement of Science um, published in 2018. 
um, on geospatial evidence in international human rights litigation. Um, I wrote part of that, my colleague Jonathan Drake, who is an analyst uh, and, and has years of experience with geospatial technologies, wrote the technical parts of it. And so there's much more detail in that report about the cases that have been brought before the, um, the International Criminal Court and the human rights courts exactly how that geospatial evidence was used, how um, how the court analyzed the admissibility of it, how it weighed the evidence, how it considered the probative value, and um, that information is in that report. Thank you. Well, I, I guess we can move on to the looking forward to the future then. Let me share my screen again. My apologies, it's a little confusing. Okay. So there are, um, uh, as I think, as as both of the presentations have uh, articulated, there is. This is all very uh, much on the cutting edge. It's very new, this kind of understanding of digital information, particularly within the law and how it can be used in a way that is um, is furthering justice and isn't being used to, um, it isn't being used as a kind of, um, incorrectly isn't being used as junk science. Uh, that's that's where we are with uh, figuring out the law, figuring out how to move this forward. And that's why we don't have a certificate program the way that uh, many, many systems do for other kinds of forensic evidence. We don't have that yet for satellite imagery and for some of the other digital evidence, but we're working toward that. That's something that a number of attorneys around the world are working on because it's an incredible opportunity as so many more people are collecting information the way that your questions have pointed out the um that we're we're there are videos posted on youtube there's fitbit data there is um, all of this information that could be used to solve uh solve some of these crimes and can be used to identify uh the to help address the the crisis of missing persons uh, in Nigeria and and also in other countries. The um, the opportunity is there at also with the uh, the new technologies that can analyze all of that data and pull that together in ways that weren't possible before. We didn't have the the computing power or the the network power to do that. The challenge is that not everyone has access to that and there is still so much data there are so many um sources of that of data that um it can be overwhelming and we still don't have uh, as much access to that as we need we don't always as, as attorneys we are not scientists we don't always understand what's possible so we don't know to try uh, we don't know what what opportunities are there so um, this is this is the challenge in front of us to try to um, with technology with better education and understanding of what this kind of evidence can do and how it can and should not be used uh, an example of the opportunities possible comes out of the uh, recent case in the International Criminal Court um, that involved destru destruction of 
cultural heritage sites in Timbuktu, the um, and the the evidence that was presented, what uh, if you can see on the screen, involved satellite imagery, photographs, traditional forensic photographs, and uh, video that was collected, and also um, videos from YouTube that the perpetrators had, the defendant had posted uh, himself. And all of this was combined in one platform that the judges could navigate between the different evidence and see uh, this video happened here on the satellite imagery. That, and now I can see how far apart they are, how close they are. Um, that's the kind of opportunity that we have before us. One of the ways that uh, attorneys are trying to figure out how to make this understandable, how to create some standards for courts so that everyone is using it the same way. It's easier to understand the authenticity, the reliability, the implications of this kind of evidence uh, are to develop protocols. So one uh, landmark effort has been undertaken by the University of California, Berkeley, in cooperation with uh, many NGOs around the world. They have created a protocol for this kind of investigation. And by open source, what they mean are um, the digital information that's accessible to all of us on Facebook, Twitter, um, all of that, uh, that doesn't re require a forensic expert or a, um, a warrant to access that. This is, this is um, what open source investigations mean. And so there are these efforts to make it predictable, which is going to be necessary for ensuring the, the fairness of the proceedings. Add to that, looking toward the future. Uh, thank you, Mr. Harris, for your excellent presentation, and thank you, everyone, for staying till now. We know we've um, gone a little bit of time, um, but So far, um, as and satellite image has long been used um, for human rights um, by the uh, works for um, as important documentation and tools. Um, again, it's been used um, to document mass in that area. But again, like I said during my presentation, what is the essence of having this kind of technology that are useful? And like my colleague said, uh, Ms. Iris said, they need to be interpreted by scientific experts and needs to be brought. You can't just make them manual. And I'm wondering, again, this is going to be a critique. And I, I think I'm as a as a citizen of the country, I can make that critique. I'm wondering why in 2011, there will be an update to evidence that in Nigeria that the evidence that the previous one is over 60 years, 68 years old. And the new evidence that in 2011 has just few provisions on digital evidence. I don't know what will happen, what went wrong, I don't know. So that is an aspect that we need to really engage with people, with our lawmaker to revamp our evidence act to capture the latest changes um, in digital evidence, in admissibility, and in proving reliability, in establishing of custody, in even setting the parameter for forensic analysis and uh, um, uh, for forensic analysis and opinion. And these are important things that we need to do if we have to deal with the issue of missing person in Nigeria. It's not a kid's game. We need to embrace that. What about people like the practitioners, the lawyers, or the angels that we need to 
increase our digital literacy, literacy um, skill set. We need to improve, improve, increase it because even if you receive training on remote sensing, on GPS positioning, you still need more information about that. Um, they are all available on the internet and I will all just to um, make, make, make use of those opportunities. In conclusion, this is a massive project that we are doing and it's very useful for the Nigeria. And again, we hope that we will share with uh, everyone, you know, our findings. But we like your feedback. You have our contact. Please send it to myself. If you need more collaboration, more information, send it to myself and also to my colleague, Ms. Iris, and they will be more than happy to engage further. Thanks. Dr. Lugo. I'm here. Um... Thank you very much, uh, Ayo and Teresa. Um, Fiki is fixed around so that I can see um, what next I'm supposed to do. Is it to thank you or to ask my own questions? Because I have so many questions, but um, if it's just to thank, um, then I'm very good at thanking people. Um, but really, it has been an interesting um presentation both from you um dr curia and uh, teresa i i also enjoyed um the questions and the polls actually because it also helped to bring into focus i mean some of the things um that um we've been doing for some time now and um i mean like uh, Innocent, who set up Clean Foundation, rightly pointed out. He told us that in the first uh, 20 years of, of Clean Foundation, it was all about uh, um, research and advocacy. But what he now asks us to do is in the next decade of Clean Foundation, we should find a way of how we can use technology to solve um, everyday problems. And I think uh, spatial technology has become one of the key things that we are looking as an organization in order to solve everyday problem of missing people, those who have been kidnapped and those who nobody really knows what has, has happened to them. So thank you very much um, um, for this opportunity. And I think uh, we will continue to engage um, with members of the consortium. And of course you especially, I was having informal conversation with Wumi um, and I was saying, why don't we do this as an annual event close to the International Day of the Disappeared and we could have different other people speak on different issues. And I thank you on the issue you have raised about the Evidence Act, that there is need for us to um, review that act. And also the, I mean, we cannot, it's not lost on us um, that Nigeria is actually a situation country at the International Criminal Court, and that if investigations are opened, um, the ICC will actually need some of these evidences in order to ensure that they hold those who are responsible for crimes against humanity and war crimes are accountable um, in Nigeria. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you for the presentations. And for the 75 plus people who are still here, um, despite the time we have spent here, we really want to appreciate you. And I want to invite Kamari Clark um, um, for her to give um, the closing remarks and the next steps. I didn't see my name initially, but since I was called to come and speak, I want to sincerely thank you um, 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 for the presentation. And I've been looking through the chats, everybody's saying wonderful presentation. So maybe we'll have to confer two of you with a professor of uh, geospatial technologies before the end of the uh, program, even though I don't have the hood and the, 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 the rest of the materials we need in conferring professorship. But that will be the discussion for another day. Thank you very much. and I hand over to Professor Kamari Clark um, for the closing remarks. Thank you, Prof, we can see you now. That's good news. <laughs> yes, uh, you can see me now <laughs> and thanks for your patience. This has been really a, a, a wonderful three hours and I'd like, we've come to the end of the session. I've, I'd like to thank Ms. Harris and Dr. Akin Roye for your excellent presentations. Uh, of course, thank you to the Clean Foundation, to, to uh, Benson and Logbo, uh, uh, Dr. Benson, uh, as we call him affectionately, as well as uh, uh, 
uh, our other colleagues with the Clean Foundation. One key takeaway from this training really is to affirm, as my colleagues have, the need for ongoing conversations about the nature of evidence, uh, especially in relation to the missing and the disappeared. Um, so we need further conversations. And as part of our collaboration, with the Clean Foundation and with uh, the, our academic partners and AAAS, we have an upcoming event to commemorate the missing uh, that we're planning at the moment with uh, the Human Rights Commission. This is all underway uh, for the, the International Day of the Missing, um, August 30th. And so you more information, uh, please stay tuned for an announcement on that through the Clean Foundation uh, list. Um, so to, to close though, just to, to bring us back to the solemn realities before us, the, issue, the issues are difficult. Um, they involve violence, they involve loss, pain, sadness, murder, from scar nation and that will be part of the, the footprint in Nigeria and well beyond Nigeria and places that are also suffering from these incidences and the growing that are causing fear, that are causing people to lose, leave villages and homes. Um, we're seeing this with our research underway in Mexico. Uh, we're, we're seeing this in Colombia. We're seeing this in many places um, around the world and, and it has to stop and we have to find and use and deploy the technologies that can allow us but to, to, to put in place deterrence uh, to, to these practices, these harmful practices. We also know that people need hope, people need tools to search. Um, they need a police force, uh, security agents, investigators who will support them and help them when they go into the police station to file a report. They need hope that something will become uh, the, the report that they've put in place. But also clearly from the presentation, we see that our, that our courts, our evident, Nigerian Evidence Acts, our laws need to be updated to accommodate the changes in, con in our contemporary world the uses of technology, the uses of Facebook, these tools too uh, need to be part of the everyday uses of um, our judicial instruments. And so there's a lot of work to be done and, and really we're grateful to our in this uh, initiative. So we thank uh, both of you, um, Teresa Harris and Dr. Akin Roye. But also we thank our participants, the CSOs, the judges, the lawyers who were here, gave up their time today to participate. Um, thank you for your excellent questions, for engaging, for staying through the entire session. The government officials who joined us, um, thank you for your interest and your participation. The Nigerian Bar Association for your interest and participation, thank you for uh, your ongoing support. Our resource persons, IO, for your presentation, of course, uh, Teresa, you've certainly brought global insights to um, the precarity that is before us in the Nigerian context. So thank you for that. Clean, of course, for your mobilization, uh, Fike, uh, and your collaboration. Your it's been really wonderful to work with you and, and to share the commitments that we have to make a change, to make a difference. AAAS, it's been wonderful to, to, to collaborate institutionally. We see Jonathan, one of our experts, our scientific expert joined us here today as well. Your collaboration, your technical support has been uh, really wonderful. Um, Wumi Dada, uh, of course, thank you for your ongoing work in this collaboration. It's been invaluable, and in many ways, you've you've been the the the, the rock that has been part of this collaboration. So thank you, and then finally to our academic partners, um, my institution, the University of Toronto and the University of California, Los Angeles, and my two collaborators, uh, SUNY at SUNY Albany, Jennifer Burrell and 
Sarah Kendall at Kent Law School. Of course, thank you for your core participation in, in this endeavor. We really wouldn't be able to collaborate with our partners without you all. And, um, and it, it really is a testament to all of our commitment to trying to make a difference. And, the, and as we work with uh, Nigerian collaborators, those of you working in judges' offices, in lawyers' offices, in among CSOs, it's clear that collaborative work can, can go far. And so let's continue with this work. Clean, uh, thank you for uh, providing the forum for this. And I hope to see everyone in August when we collaborate on the commemoration of the missing. This is a very important part of the technical skills that we share. It's also to recognize those who we've lost or whose story still remains untold. And so we call you all to join us for that event. More announcements, as I've said, will be available very soon on the clean listserv. And, uh, and we, we truly are looking forward to it. So thanks again. This is the end of this session. All the best, take care, and let's continue the good work. Bye-bye now.